question number one. The Secretary of State for International Trade, Secretary Dr Liam Fox. Speaker, since he is a conscientious and committed member of the House of Commons, the Honourable Gentleman will know that the Government published a trade white paper on Monday the 9th of October 2017. The trade white paper establishes the principles that will guide future UK trade policy and sets out the preparatory steps we're taking. The paper can be found in the libraries of both houses and on the government.uk website. In Cunningham. Can the Secretary of State say what uh, transitional plans he's got <coughs> for the transitional period whereby he may not be able to get necessarily do the de trade deals that he wants to do? But, Mr Speaker, if the Honourable Gentleman is referring to the transitional adoption of existing uh, EU agreements, uh, we've had a very positive response from other governments. They, like ourselves, want to ensure that there's no disruption uh, of trade at the point of departure of the European Union. We will want to get as many of those in place as we can. Partly that depends upon the willingness of partners to get it ready on time. There are obviously contingency measures available to us under WTO to ensure continued market access in any case. Sir Desmond Swain. Can we just declare for free trade? Uh, Mr Speaker, this government constantly declares for free trade. In fact, as we leave the European Union and take up our independent seat on the World Trade Organization, this country intends to champion the cause of global free trade, especially at a time when the growth in trade has been slowing down in recent years. Lloyd. Mr Speaker, does the International Trade Secretary recognise that uh, people fear that in the event of, for example, a very right-wing ideological government, we could see the erosion of, stand of um, social standards uh, by our trade agreements, or even the kind of concerns about the erosion of our ability to protect our National Health Service with the wrong type of trade treaty. Will the Minister guarantee that there will be parliamentary scrutiny of every trade deal done? Mr Speaker, um, I would like the, judgment of the government to be judged by its actions. Uh, and therefore, as, we, as his honourable friend has indicated, as we want to transition the already agreed EU free trade agreements into UK law, which will include, for example, workers' rights, environmental standards, uh, I would hope that we will get the full support of the opposition in doing so and in getting the legislation available to give us the powers to do so. Well, Prisk. Speaker, the white paper sets out a very strong case for free trade. It's good for growth, it's good for jobs, but occasionally other countries will act in unfair ways, such as dumping of goods. Can the Secretary of State therefore confirm that it will always be the government's approach to respond to that in a proportionate, carefully targeted and time-limited fashion? Mr Speaker, the government will bring forward legislation which will set out uh, our plans for a trade remedies authority to ensure that the protections that UK business currently has and the UK workforce currently enjoys are, are continued when we leave the European Union. Yeah, yeah. Much, Mr. Speaker, white yeah. papers are all good and well, but yesterday the Scottish Government published a report that showed what is at stake for business as the UK edges further closer to the Brexit cliff edge. We know the Secretary of State has consulted the business community to find out how it will affect them, but will he commit today to publish the findings right. as called on by a range of MPs right. across this House, even if the findings show that business wants to stay in the single market and customs union? At what point will this Government stop governing in secret and publish the reality of the impact of Brexit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the government is of course extremely uh, concerned about any perceptions of instability uh, and we will consult widely, particularly when it comes to new free trade agreements. But of course the greatest threat to instability, particularly in Scotland, is the insistence of the Scottish yeah. Government on threatening a second referendum on independence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Question number two, Mr Speaker. Minister Mark Garnier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State for exiting the European Union will be leading negotiations on our trade relationship with the EU, aimed at the greatest possible tariff and barrier-free trade with our European neighbours, including the automotive sector. The UK will also be able to negotiate our own trade agreements around the world, and it is a high priority that we achieve the best possible deals with global partners. We are in close contact with stakeholders across the automotive industry to this end. Mr Williamson. Uh, last month, the Prime Minister, in a speech to the Bank of England, described the free market economy as the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. In view of her ideological objection to government intervention, I wonder if the Minister could say how the highly skilled workforce at Toyota in Derbyshire 
will be able to find comparable employment in the event of Toyota relocating thanks to the government's botched Brexit negotiations. Well, I know the Honourable Member uh, stands up for those constituents of his who work at the Toyota plant, but I think, I think we need to look more carefully at what Toyota themselves are doing. And they have made a £240 million investment into the Burniston factory in order to make a commitment towards uh, the UK after Brexit. And that has been supported by a further £21.5 million, which has been put in by the government, who is also committed to those workers he describes in his constituency. Yeah. Bridget. Given that the UK imports £30 billion worth of vehicles, more than we export each year, does my honourable friend agree with me that it's not just in the UK's interest, but also the EU's, that we have barrier and tariff-free trade on vehicles in the future? Yeah. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. We are absolutely committed to a tariff and barrier-free uh, relationship with the European Union going forward. It's worth remembering that the European Union exports to Britain twice as many cars as we export to them. It is in all our interests for all workers across the whole of the European Union that we come to a very successful and fruitful outcome. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, following the referendum and the subsequent depreciation of sterling, a number of car manufacturers in Britain have announced plans for further investment in expanding production, particularly Nissan, who yeah. said they're going to in, in, in expand production by 20% and invest more in the supply chain in Britain. Isn't, doesn't this augur, augur well for? for Britain's exports, and shouldn't we start look towards a, work, a time where we can export more than we import? Yeah, yeah. Well, my honourable friend, uh, the honourable gentleman is absolutely right. It is, uh, it is one of the characteristics of the UK car industry over the last few years, as we've now seen uh, UK components of the supply chain representing 42% up from 38%. Um, there is a great opportunity that we uh, have in the whole of the European Union automotive sector, and this is something which, uh, which our department is working incredibly hard to make sure that we take advantage of. Yes, you do. Mr. Philip that this country voted to leave the European Union, isn't it the duty of every member of this House to talk up the British economy yeah. and the chances yeah. of British manufacturing exploiting the new opportunities that will be presented to it around the world? Again, my honourable friend is absolutely right. I travel the world, as indeed do all our ministers, going around and meeting businesses in countries around the world that see the huge value that this country has and the great British brand that we are representing in this department and selling abroad. It is fantastic what we have to offer in this country, and I am an unashamed patriot of the great exports that we have from fabulous businesses such as Aston Martin through to any number of businesses I see. It is a duty of everybody in this House to support all those businesses and to talk up the British Isles when they travel, not just across the world, but also in the UK. John Bray. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State has just said he wants the government to be judged by its actions. So can the Minister tell us what the cost of the Nissan deal was, whether deals have been struck with other car manufacturers, and whether the government has set aside a large budget to ensure that other sectors are able to continue to export successfully? Well, the Honourable Gentleman will know full well that under state aid rules, which don't just apply with the European Union but also with the World Trade Organisation, the government cannot do eight subsidies to businesses in order to ensure uh, an unfair comp competition against uh, other countries. But I also me uh, mentioned in an earlier answer that the government has supported uh, companies like Toyota with their £21 million investment, and any support that will be given to any businesses, be they in the automotive sector or across the whole of the piece, will be fully compliant with all those rules that we abide by. And, uh, and are there uh, in order to, uh, 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 you know, widely known as uh, things such as uh, ERDF type of uh, subsidies, and they are perfectly fair and perfectly legal. Well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Department for International Trade supports foreign investment across all parts of the UK through our Overseas Network International Events Programme, bespoke sector support, online services, and regional teams. We serve the whole of the UK by working closely with investment promotion bodies in the devolved administrations and local enterprise partnerships in England and cooperate effectively across a range of investment support activities. News this morning about Toyota and Nissan. Will the Minister join me in welcoming the recent EMY work, proving that the UK remains the most attractive place in Europe for FDI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right. We have seen some uh, truly amazing numbers coming in. Britain is now the, uh, has record inward uh, investment yeah, projects, yeah. and it's also worth bearing in mind that over the um, uh, last year or so, we have seen, as a result of foreign direct investment, 158,000 jobs have been created, and a further 66,000 jobs have been safeguarded. Mr. Barry Chairman. Surely the Minister, and I'm very happy for him to go uh, selling Britain around the world, 
Will he come to the real economy in places like Huddersfield, where we have a strong manufacturing sector? <coughs> Will he come even to the city or to Leeds, where we have a financial sector? And not one person I meet in those sectors wants us to continue with this folly of Brexit. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> yes, it, it, what, about, what about all of those voters across the whole of the UK, who, who uh, 52 per cent of which voted? Look, I you know, was, a, was a Remainer. But we, have to, but we have to uphold the fundamental principle of democracy in this country. And, uh, and it is the job of all of us in government to ensure that we do our level best to embrace the opportunities and the, actually the optimistic opportunities that Brexit presents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to thank the Minister for coming to my constituency and talking to my exporters and the Port of Felixstowe. Um, but I would like him to assure me that he took that takeout, that they really want us to be ready, oven ready, with regulations and so on, as we look to move out of, um, out of the common market. Well, it was a great pleasure to visit Munsters in her constituency. Um, her constituency, from what they produce there, are, is putting a huge amount of ingredients into Scottish whisky, into beer, into any number of uh, fantastic things across the country. Look, it is absolutely right that when we are looking at regulations going forward into a post-Brexit era, that we absolutely in this country maintain our incredibly high standards of regulation, and that includes workers' rights as well as food standards. The Minister is assuring his honourable friend that he is indeed oven-ready. <laughs> That's a new one on me. <coughs> the honourable lady has very helpfully added to the collective lexicon of the House of Commons. Sir Vince Cable. Why does the government not make a clearer distinction between inward foreign investment, which adds to capacity and jobs and is welcome, and inward investment for acquisitions in devalued pounds, which often detracts from our science and technology? Um, the, 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 the leader of the Liberal Democrats uh, raises actually a really important point when it looks at statistics. And he is absolutely right that fresh investment that comes into this country that does create jobs and safeguard jobs is something which has to be disaggregated from things such as stock market transactions where you have a significant investment into that type of thing. It is, um, we do actually, uh, we are looking very carefully at how to disaggregate these two things in order to get a much clearer position. But he raises an important point and, and I can assure him that the department's uh, economists are looking at this. Mr. Stephen Crabb. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the 12 months since the EU referendum in 2016, 32 Israeli companies have invested in new business ventures in the UK, bringing an increase in capital investment of 32% from that country. Doesn't that demonstrate, first of all, a strong vote of confidence in the UK economy, but secondly, shows that Israel should be a natural partner for any future free trade agreement? Well, indeed, I visited Israel, and, um, and we do a lot of trade, and with the, the investment they're making to this country is very, very welcome. But I think it's very important that we are, that, that since the Brexit vote, we are seeing a huge number of investment projects coming into the UK that are creating new jobs. There is uh, doom mongers like myself, Mr. Speaker, who during the during the referendum were part of the Project Fear campaign, have been have been proved wrong. And I think it's important that we stand up and say, so far, we have not got this right. And that is incredibly good news for both Britain and our individual constituents. Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the government's own figures show a 9% drop in the number of new jobs created through foreign direct investment projects and a record trade deficit in goods exports. So in the real world, that means thousands of workers losing their jobs, as we've seen at BAE, BAE Systems, Mr Speaker. But does he accept it will take a fully aligned trade and industrial strategy to protect jobs in this country? The current policy of relying on a falling pound is simply not good enough. Uh, I would just refer the gentleman to the, uh, to the fact that we now have record numbers of people in work, record employment and record unemployment. But nonetheless, he, he does raise an important point with the, with the relationship between this department and the, and the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. It is absolutely the case that when we are creating a pitch book for the UK, we have to have something which offers a, a number of different opportunities for co uh, country, companies around the world. And part of that is our tax regime, part of that is our tax credits regime, part of that is our enthusiasm to legislate, for example, to allow autonomous vehicles to be tested on all British roads. This is a whole package of the entire government working together. So he's absolutely right to raise the industrial strategy as part of what we are presenting to the rest of the world, but it is the whole of the government. Uh, question number four, Mr Speaker. Minister Greg Hands. Uh, Mr Speaker, the UK has long supported the promotion of our values globally, 
including successfully supporting workers' rights and environmental protections as a member of the EU. And the UK will continue to play a leading role on these as we leave the EU. We are committed to upholding the UK's high standards. Our prosperity benefits from us reinforcing these high standards, not yeah. abandoning them. Yeah, yeah. I am Debonair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm glad that the White Paper mentions respecting the role of Parliament, but in order to protect workers' rights, fair trade and environmental rules, will he now guarantee to transfer to this House the rights our elected representatives in the European Parliament have to scrutinise, debate, amend and vote on trade agreements? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, the Government has been absolutely clear on the importance of this House and this Parliament scrutinising trade agreements. But can I just mention to her the irony in her question? Only last month she voted against the EU withdrawal bill that actually wrote into domestic legislation 40 years of workers' rights and environmental protection coming from Europe. She didn't want to see that transfer, and now today she's calling for us to introduce European uh, procedures. Mr Speaker, I think uh, she even whipped her own side to vote against the withdrawal bill. I think her actions speak louder than her words. Number five, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions five and ten together. As the Prime Minister set out on Monday, the Government is preparing for the UK's future as an independent trading nation. We will maximise our opportunities globally by seeking a deep and special partnership with the EU and boosting our trade relationships around the world. The Trade White Paper establishes the principles that will guide future UK trade policy and sets out the preparatory steps we are taking, as the Secretary of State laid out earlier in response to question one. Mr. Marcus Fish. Mr. Speaker, can my right honourable friend confirm it is government policy to take full control of the UK's trade policy and services regulation in order to take advantage of the free trade opportunities that are open to us as we leave the EU? And does he agree this must not be obviated by any conditions of a period of implementation for our new arrangements with the EU? Well, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has made very clear that we want a deep and comprehensive trade agreement with the EU. Uh, we in the Department for International Trade are losing no time in preparing ourselves for our own independent trade policy in terms of transitioning existing EU FTAs, in terms of the 14 trade working groups that we've set up, and in terms of transitioning trade preferences for the developing world. And that includes the ability to scope out and negotiate new trade agreements once we leave. Mr. Raymond Chishti. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister update the House what work the Government is doing to engage with frontier markets and how these are being prioritised with already existing established markets? Well, Mr. Speaker, can I first of all congratulate my honourable friend uh, on becoming the Prime Minister's trade envoy to Pakistan? Yeah. Which I can tell him went down extremely well on my visit to Islamabad last month. Uh, we are devoting resources to both frontier and emerging markets through our Economic Horizons Group. Uh, we are committed to transitioning the EU scheme of trade preferences with those markets into a UK scheme, which will bring real economic assistance to developing countries, including Pakistan. Jim Shellen. Uh, Northern Ireland will be the only part of the United Kingdom to share a land border with an EU member state after the UK leaves the EU. What discussions has the Minister had with his counterparts in Northern Ireland regarding future trade and investment opportunities and potential issues post-Brexit? Well, Mr Speaker, the whole of government is engaging uh, very closely uh, with those in authority in Northern Ireland, which uh, he will be well aware of. Uh, and also engaging uh, with the other side of the border, uh, I should be meeting the uh, Irish Trade Minister tomorrow. This is Helen Goodman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given what the Minister says, why hasn't the Government responded positively to the request that Singapore made ten months ago to revive the third country trading pa training partnership, which in their words would support global Britain's role in the Commonwealth and ASEAN? Well, well, Mr Speaker, the, the Government takes extremely seriously uh, the Commonwealth and ASEAN. In fact, yesterday we hosted a celebration uh, for ASEAN's anniversary. And the Commonwealth, Mr Speaker, we actually hosted the first Commonwealth Trade Ministers meeting ever uh, in March here in London, and we're making extensive preparations towards Chogham taking place next year. 
Helen Waitley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could my right honourable friend advise what steps the government is taking to make sure businesses don't face a cliff edge for trade with countries beyond the EU, but those that, that are covered in trade agreements that the EU has when we leave the EU? <laughs> Well, Mr. Speaker, the government is devoting, uh, the Department of International Trade is devoting significant efforts uh, towards transitioning the EU's existing FTAs to be a UK FTA. Uh, we are doing this in consultation uh, with the European Union, and uh, the majority of countries, and certainly all of the ones we've spoken to so far, third parties are in agreement with this. Uh, just two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, I was in Peru, and the Secretary of State was in Colombia. And my honourable friend, the member of Wire Forest, met with the Ecuadorian uh, Trade Minister to talk about the transition of the EU and DN FTA, a perfect example in this space. Jerry McCarthy. Question six, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I discussed the UK's independent membership of the World Trade Organization with the US Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer when I visited the United States in July. And I've had a number of productive conversations with WTO Director Roberto Azevedo most recently on my visit to Geneva in July. Gary McCarthy. I, I understand that the, uh, Britain and the EU have now formally informed WTO members of how they would like the tariffs to be split, the quotas to be split after Brexit. But we already know that the Trump administration, and I think seven members of the WTO, have rejected those proposals. What is the minister now going to do to try to ensure that a deal on quotas is achieved? I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for giving, her the chance, uh, giving me the chance to explain our methodology. What we decided was as we split the quotas that we have up, up to now shared with the European Union, we would do so on a market basis. In other words, we wouldn't divide by 28 or divide by 15 as we were in, but on the share that markets have in the UK already. The reason that we did that was so that we would not disadvantage exporters from another country, we wouldn't disadvantage our own producers or our own consumers. That is the best route to avoiding disputes at Switzerland. Peter Baird. As we're talking about WTO, um, what if the uh, country cannot reach a de deal with the EU? What, what are the plans his department have laid out, in particular in relation to the WTO, if we don't go into the, uh, uh, the agreement and the quotas? Well, Mr. Speaker, as, as I've said, we are, uh, first of all, we have to get our trading schedules agreed. Then we have to get our free trade agreements with our countries agreed. They involve uh, the division of quotas. We are making good progress on that. We want to see uh, a comprehensive agreement because we believe that is in the interest uh, of all concerned. But, of course, the government is making uh, preparations uh, contingent on there being no agreement. That would be the only responsible thing for any government to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Varigarpa. Yeah. Look, the Secretary of State knows full well that a technical rectification does in fact disadvantage other members. That's why the seven member states of the WTO have written to Azevedo specifically setting out that it's unacceptable to them. He said on the 6th of July that he was confident that a technical rectification of WTO schedules would be smooth and fully understood by our trading partners. Well, it's not. What's he now going to do about it and what assessment has he made of the delays and the impact on our business? Businesses that will result from it. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't anticipate that that will happen, and clearly the Honourable Gentleman doesn't understand a what a process is and b what a negotiation is. It's quite clear. It's quite clear that the very first offer we make is not the final thing that we expect to be accepted, because, for example, we have no agreement yet on what will happen with unused quota or what will happen with AMS. These are issues to be dealt with during a negotiation. And, and I know he likes to multitask, but being able to speak and listen simultaneously is not amongst those. Well, uh, topical questions, Mr. Henry Smith. One, sir. Indeed. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Department for International Trade has three tasks, promoting UK exports to support a growing economy that serves the whole country, maximising opportunities for wealth creation, including through overseas direct investment, and negotiating the best international trading framework for the UK outside the EU. Permission, Mr Speaker, I would like today to welcome Crawford Faulkner to the DIT yeah, as yeah, Chief yeah, Trade yeah. Negotiation Advisor with the wealth of knowledge he brings and I would like to announce the convening of the Board of Trade today, ensuring that the benefits of trade and investment are spread across the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah. 
Mr Speaker, in its Brexit negotiations, the EU Commission seems hell-bent on damaging the remaining member states' economies. Uh, so uh, can uh, my right honourable friend uh, say what preparations are being made for no deal? Mr Speaker, we believe that the best thing for the whole of Europe is for us to reach a deep and comprehensive agreement on trade. We are committed to do so and we hope that our European partners will show the commitment to move to the second stage of negotiations as soon as possible, not least to remove any uncertainty to business and workers across Europe. Uh, but if we are not able to do so, the Government will, has already undertaken across Government a wide range of contingency plans. Following the Bombardier tariff crisis, can the Secretary of State guarantee that Airbus and Bristol, who employ many people in my constituency, will not have new tariffs to pay once Britain leaves the EU? Whoa, good question. Well, um, I think, uh, Mr Speaker, there are, there are two elements there. Of course, we want to maintain a completely tariff-free trading environment in Europe, and that is what we should be able to do, given that's the starting point, which, of course, is unique in any uh, trade negotiation. As for the Bombardier case, we've made our views very clear to the United States, including I've spoken to uh, uh, Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, only last week. Uh, indeed, the government's approach uh, based on the Florence speech is entirely sensible and pragmatic, and of course we want a free trade deal, but it takes two to tango. So can I press the Secretary of State more on earlier questions relating to what happens if there is no deal? and we leave the single market at the end of March. Can he inform the House that the Treasury is giving him all the resources he needs to prepare for no deal in terms of preparing schedules, making deals with other countries? This is absolutely vital. Well, Mr. Speaker, our department, uh, and I don't really wish to, to trumpet this to other departments, does have a unique agreement with the Treasury that we are able to increase our, our staffing levels where it uh, relates to Brexit-related issues. Uh, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, but as I said, we want to ensure uh, that we will get a good deal. But there is no difference between the Chancellor and myself. The Chancellor says that we need to uh, spend money only as necessary. I think that's correct. But we also need to be ensure that we spend money on all areas where contingency plans are necessary. Mr. Barry Gardner. <laughs> Looks perplexed. We are on topic. Will the Honourable General try to keep up? Thank you, sir. Always good to have you keeping me up to the pace, Mr. Speaker. Recent reports suggest that Boeing provided Monarch Airlines with 45 Boeing 737 MAX jets at cut price, and that Boeing used a complex sale and leaseback deal to provide Monarch with more than £100 million of cash against a paper profit. Given his earlier commitment to trade defence remedies, why has he left it to me to write to the EU commissioners to ask that they investigate this as a matter of potential illegal dumping and anti-competitive behaviour? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to look at uh, uh, his, uh, uh, the precise nature of his allegation, but I, I have to say, Mr Speaker, um, the government's response on Monarch has been exemplary. We have devoted an incredible amount of resources to getting tens of thousands of stranded British subjects abroad back to this country, uh, a process led by the Department for Transport uh, in an incredibly good way, uh, and I think we should be proud of the government's efforts in relation to helping the victims of honour. Topical number three. Right. Uh, <laughs> I certainly will. Sheep, sheep. Sheep farming in this country is both good for the countryside food and farming. And a combination of making sure that we, we control quotas of New Zealand lamb along with maintaining that export to, to France is absolutely important. So I just want to ask the Secretary of State, how is he getting on in dis disaggregating the EU quotas on New Zealand lamb meat? Uh, Mr Speaker, we will take the same approach to New Zealand lamb as all other TRQs which are to allocate them on the basis of usage. And as I've already explained, that will keep the market stable. It will mean that we're not uh, disadvantaging New Zealand exporters and we're not disadvantaging our, our domestic market. That's not only the fairest thing to do, but the best way to avoid the UK being taken to dispute at WTO, which is again in our mutual advantage. Thank us, Brendan McNeil. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. If the EU27 uh, doesn't give the 
two-year extension the Prime Minister begged for in Florence. With how many countries will the UK find its trade barriers rising? Does the Department have a number? <laughs> 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 Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure I, I fully understood his question, but there are, if it's helpful for him, there are 27 other countries in the European Union. If it's also helpful for him, the EU has more than 40 FTAs around the world, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the roles of our department is to transition those FTAs to be UK-only FTAs, which should avoid seeing any cliff edge or future trade barriers there at all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Trade Out of Poverty, APPG, which I chair, has uh, initiated an investigation into the role that the Commonwealth can play in helping developing nations uh, trade out of poverty, and it's uh, a, an agenda that we hope will be taken up in Trogham in April. We have a potential leadership role here, so will he communicate with the Commonwealth Secretariat to ensure that that agenda item is taken up? Yeah, Mr Speaker, uh, uh, we have made very, very clear that we see uh, our trade policy and our developmental policy is going hand in hand. We want to see countries in the world be able to have the power to trade their way out of poverty. And that will be one of the key themes that we will have at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. And we will be setting out processes by which we think that can be made uh, more uh, possible in the future. Uh, many of the businesses in my constituency are signing contracts early in the new year for exports in 2019, including particularly sheep and dairy farmers. What certainty can the Secretary of State give them about pricing for 2019? Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, our aim is to maintain market stability. But of course, the good news is that the UK is continuing uh, to export extremely well. And in the 12 months to uh, November to uh, August 2017, we saw something like a 15% increase in our exports. It's something we want to encourage, and we want to be ensuring that we get bigger market penetration, irrespective of what the deal we get with the European Union is. Richard Graham, where is the fella? Mr. Peter Bone. Mr. Speaker, will the Secretary of State publish the Department's plans for a no deal situation before Christmas? Well, Mr. Speaker, across government we will make our plans uh, on contingency, uh, but we continue to hope that the European Union uh, will come forward with uh, proper uh, con uh, uh, commitment to entering into the second part uh, of the uh, trade deal as we think is in our mutual interests. Order. Questions to the Minister for Women and Equality.